What's up, y'all? My name is Trevor Went. I'm a visual artist raised in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I make art to challenge perspectives and give hope to the marginalized and oppressed. In this space, Do Rag Thoughts is a space where we do just that. We talk about topics and conversations that challenge perspectives and give hope to the marginalized and oppressed. And in season two of Do Rag Thoughts, we've been journeying through my series, my project, City of God. And today we're talking about, as we're coming towards the the close of the series, the close of the project, we're talking about the video that released on Monday, the track Emmanuel Avenue. And I'm excited to, to delve into that and some of the themes and concepts around this. If you haven't seen the video, go back and pause this video and go back and watch that video before you kind of dive into this conversation. This conversation will be much more fruitful if you do that. And yeah, today my conversation partner is a great friend of mine, um, is the JC Serve coordinator at a church in Tennessee, um, is a person who I met in seminary, who's been just a foundational friend for me, has stood by me in some of, um, just some of the toughest times of my life in the last couple of years, and also some of the greatest times of my life in the last couple of years. Um, is also someone that I had the privilege to stand beside on um, his wedding day. Um, a person that has taught me a ton about hospitality um, and loving others. A person who's loved by many is, has been someone who has given me all sorts of wisdom. I mean, there's a reason why he's the JC Serve coordinator at his, his church, the serving the people of the community, because he's a person whose mindset I've continually seen to to love and reach out to people and to just show people Jesus through his life. And so I'm excited to introduce y'all today, which I guess I'm not really introducing you for the first time. I'm introducing you for the second time to my friend, Nathan Kacharis. What's up, dog? Hi, Trevor. Uh, Thanks for having me on. Yeah, I'm glad that you're here. Thanks for that kind list of uh of things you're just making up, gassing me up. Hey, Ka, you know what it is. Um, gotta gotta give you your flowers while you're still here, Ka, um, and while I'm still here. So, to give people a quick background to the the track uh, Emmanuel Avenue. So the story it's it's really an overview just surrounding my experience in my first semester of seminary and some of the things that I felt um, in reflection on just the perspective that it was giving me in terms of engaging with my friends, engaging with, with friends in college, people who, uh, who lived a different lifestyle than me, who were not Christians or were Christians with questions and, and different things like that. And so uh, I really was coming to a different understanding towards the end of college and then um, in my gap year, unintentional gap year, and then into seminary about some of some of the ways that I was looking at the world and how some of those things could be not as helpful in terms of, of trying to do what I was actually trying to do, which was, you know, show people Jesus Christ through my life, you know, trying to trying to show people the impact and the power of the gospel and and at times getting caught up on things that i don't even think it was worth getting caught up on um and so yeah for me in that time i i feel like there was such a beginning kind of like foundational shift of my worldview like there was i felt like i was i was coming towards um that anyway towards the end of college because i i remember saying a statement like in the summer it was like the bible could pass away and i would still be a christian because i've had too many experiences with with god that are just inexplainable like inexplicable kind of situations like there's no other there's no other way to explain some of these moments that i've had in my life outside of there being a higher being um and i think Jesus Christ is is the most compelling figure in history, um, and and I I you know believe in the life, you know the death, the burial, the resurrection of Christ, and and so um, really holding that stuff at at a foundation, but then also like allowing 
larger questions that I might not have considered kind of come into play was such an important aspect of of my my beginning of my seminary journey, my end of college and in that kind of year of space in between and and just you know the time of like really trying to engage what does it mean to minister to people? What does it mean to have conversations with people? What does it mean to humanize people's lives and efforts and ways of thinking about the world? So for you, um, I don't know that we've ever really talked about this topic specifically within even all the things that we talk about, you know, on, you know, on a consistent basis with one another or even in our seminary journeys. But for you, was there any sort of, was there any sort of like reshaping of your mindset with some of the stuff that you were rocking through like early on in seminary? Um, or, or were you already kind of within a space of foundation with, you know, your, your college journey and, and some of the, the work you were kind of doing and like the biblical studies kind of theological thinking about God spaces? Hmm. Yeah, that, that's a, that's a good question. And it makes my, my mind does several things, I guess, and thinking about ways to answer that question. Um, I guess, I guess one kind of observation is that my experience in seminary, I, I learned a ton and I grew and I changed. However, I think if like we were doing like a narrative arc or something, I, I, I don't feel like I had a major um, kind of crisis, uh, like we might say like an epistemological crisis or like a crisis of knowledge um, that I learned some stuff that, uh, that really broke me down and, and I had to reevaluate things at a fundamental level. Some people have an experience like that at seminary. Um, but like anything, um, it's not, uh, an entirely uniform experience. Um, uh, I feel kind of looking back, um, through my, I did undergrad at Milligan, uh, as you know, Trev, and uh, the kind of biblical studies components were right, were right in line, um, kind of a, a natural, felt like a natural progression. And even, even growing up, I, I <laughs> we'll, we'll get to, uh, I'm excited to hear your take on uh, David and Goliath here by the end of this, uh, this, this uh, conversation here, Trev, but yeah. Um, but but in the kind of I don't feel necessarily that I was even like working against um, how I was raised, um, but rather that I've just kind of been prepared um, to learn and to grow. And so so that so that's one way of kind of looking at it is I I, I don't feel like I had like an epistemological crisis, but um, that was not to say that I didn't have um, uh, a crisis. Um, or multiple. Um, but for me, I think just to, to put it simply, um, a really challenging and kind of paradigm shifting period of time during my early years in seminary, uh, particularly, um, it came when I just really in that first semester, especially where I realized that since the seventh grade, I had been going to school, um, kind of for the next thing. Um, seventh grade is the first time I remember the, the local private high schools came and set up uh, booths to say, hey, you could come to our high school, you know, so keep your, keep your grades up and we'll let, um, and we could let you come here. And I, I ended up going to public school and that sort of thing. But, and then of course, in high school, there's, we've such a strong cultural narrative about, um, uh, in, in many, in many areas, I guess I should say th that you need, you need to go to college or something like that. Um, and, and so from early on in high school, there's this awareness of like, I've got to like put my work in now cause it's going to lead to college and kind of whatever comes after that. And similarly, I was already thinking about grad school or seminary in one way or another at the time I started at Milligan in undergrad. Um, and, 
and although I really have loved school my whole uh, my whole kind of academic career, um, and I always would have said that I'm doing this like because I love learning and that sort of thing. Um, I think looking back, there's always been a part of uh, my motivation for school that's been oriented toward like making the grades so I can like do the next thing um, really well. Um, however, it's kind of to the end of my under time in undergrad, I kind of realized I don't want to do a PhD. Um, I don't want more school after my next school. And very suddenly in my first semester at Emmanuel, um, I had to come to terms with how much of my motivation in school previously had been oriented toward just kind of getting good enough grades to be kind of both considered as a smart person, as well as just kind of maintaining my eligibility for what was coming next. But for the first time, the next step wasn't more school. The next step uh, was a life of uh, ministry, uh, a life of service, a life of um, friendship and worship and um, right living. And suddenly um, I was for the first time in a place where it was really clear that it actually wasn't my grades that were going to determine um, what, or it wasn't my grades that were going to be the most accurate metric for how well I was doing. Um, and that, <laughs> to, to look back at that, it's, it's kind of frustrating that that was so disorienting for me. Um, but for the first time, even though I'd been saying this was like an ideal, I was actually in a place where my grades weren't actually going to matter. Um, and where for the first time, it, what was actually most important was the way in which my life and um, my commitments and my, um, my friendships and my current and future ministry are, are, are coming to the fore. Um, one of the things that um, someone who's been important for both of us, Trev, um, Ethan Magnus, um, and as well as um, Phil Kennison, who teaches at Milligan, um, helped me to kind of articulate um, as a central uh, kind of purpose uh, is, is the concept of a, of a gift. Um, and, and it became very clear to me that, that my goal, my purpose in seminary was not to post a bunch of good grades or get recognized in the academy, um, but rather to faithfully kind of cultivate my life and my preparation and skill set as a gift that I might be able to share, uh, to give, um, that might bring um, comfort or surprise or blessing or critique or, um, or exhortation or encouragement or solidarity um, as the gospel directs and as the gospel um, leads as a part of the church and also uh, in my other relationships and communities. Um, and, and I guess maybe that's, that's maybe more than you asked for Trev, but I, but I think those things are connected to me that like, it feels important to acknowledge that for some people, and I think maybe it, it, from our, some of our conversations, some people have kind of turning points in kind of mental frameworks of certain ideas. Um, but for me, it was about purpose and what school and what learning and what, um, this particular education um, can and should be for. Um, and for me, that's tried to orient around the theme of gift. Um, it, yeah. 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 I think that's super, I think that's super interesting and dope. Um, you know, I feel like, so, so I think a difference for us in this, in the sense of like that conversation um, was for me when I was growing up, right? Um, I don't know why, like I had this like cognitive dissonance between like how important my grades in high school were because like grade school and middle school, they, it wasn't really that important. You know, your, your elementary school grade performance didn't affect you going to middle school. Um, your middle school grade performance 
it didn't necessarily affect you going to high school. Right. Um, you know, if you're trying to, for, for my area, you could apply to different academies. And I did, I applied to the technology academy um, where I ultimately went to high school at Lansdowne High School in Virginia Beach. Shout out LHS, you know? Um, and, I wish I went to an academy. Bruh, you know? I, I, it sounds real serious. It was, it was good, but it also didn't really make a whole lot of sense because I learned a bunch of things. Like I was doing like a pre-engineering track, but I didn't want to be an engineer. I want to be an artist. Like, I, but I was like my, I, at first I wanted to like design motorcycles, like in that time of my life. Yeah. Cause I wanted to design like freaking choppers, which is wild because I would never get them on a motorcycle now. Like I just like, there's, there's aesthetics that I like about like bobbers and stuff, but I don't, motorcycles are stupid dangerous and i y'all met like y'all who paid attention to the series met my sister krista who's an orthopedic surgeon and she's like she's done too many surgeries like or seen too many accidents in the or where she sees people's femurs shattered from motorcycle accidents and it's like inevitable you're gonna crash on a motorcycle and so yeah, but when exactly and so i have no intention to get on a motorcycle at any point in this life but i loved like i i i really liked like the orange county chopper type shows and stuff like that when i was a kid like when i was like in a certain space of my childhood in like middle school because i i don't know the creativity surrounding it was so interesting but then like towards the end of high school i wanted to do industrial design because I felt like it was the one design, uh, design like group or design, uh, design major or design career path that included a vast array of things. Like you could be an industrial designer and design an iPhone or design the next Nike shoe. And so that was really appealing to me because art and design and fashion and stuff like this have always been integral parts of my life in some capacity. Um, and so I knew that was a part of who I was. Uh, but I, you know, to get to the academy, like our bus came at 520 in the morning. And so for a kid who it was like, you're going to tell a kid that for all his like time in a school year for four years straight that he's going to get up at freaking like go to sleep at like you know, 10 o'clock at night or nine o'clock at night and like be up at four o'clock in the morning so that he can get on the bus and then be at school from, you know, six o'clock in the morning to six o'clock in the evening, basically, because of like activity buses for athletics. Um, like that's a grind, man. And so it's not like I wasn't still, it wasn't like, it wasn't like I was, yeah. And it, and it wasn't like I was, not getting up and getting on the bus and stuff. It was just, I was struggling to, um, I was, I was struggling to go to sleep early because I'm a night owl anyway. And so I spent a lot of, like my freshman year, I'd fall asleep in my algebra class in my first class of the day, which I feel like it's just was, a, was an ill done to me. Um, and I remember I had this, this teacher, Mr. Man Lunas, um, Filipino cat and he would all, I would always fall asleep in his class because I was so exhausted from having to get up that early and I wasn't drinking coffee or nothing. And he would come and tap on my desk like really lightly and just be like, wake up, Mr. Wan, Mr. Wan, Mr. Wan, Mr. Wan. And so like, it'd be funny, like my homie Min, Min Win back in high school, he would always like see me in the hallway and be like, me and you star, <laughs> like that's like, it's like, so there's a lot of my, my high school space that like, I was just trying to stay awake for certain things. And so I didn't get until like my friends were like, I mean, I had like three of my closest friends in the top five of the class in terms of, you know, academic standing. And one of my teammates also, you know, within like the top 10. And so people I was immediately surrounded by were the smartest people around me. My best friend in high school was, was the valedictorian of the high school, right? And so I remember like when we got our like academic rank, you know, our junior year or whatever, I was like, dang, like I'm not, 
I'm not killing it right now because I wasn't really paying attention to that stuff as like some next step. And I think part of it just had to do with like some of the trauma of my childhood um, and some of the stuff that we were rocking through in a single parent household and, and um, you know, some of the different spaces that we had to, to overcome. And so I just didn't have the perspective for that because there was no one who was really telling me and I hadn't made the connection in my mind. And so I didn't, I didn't recognize the importance of working towards a goal uh, within that to get to college and to not have debt and this, that, and the third, right? And so then, you know, I go to college on a wrestling scholarship and then I am very goal oriented. Uh, but I also knew that I wanted like, I wanted a design major, but there were no design majors at my school and I was there on a wrestling scholarship. And so you go where it pays, uh, it, which, which was the tension, right? And so here I am in East Tennessee at a school that doesn't really have anything for me. And then I ultimately found photography and it's been a massive like space of expression for me. But once I, once I felt like I had this like calling towards like pastoral ministry and stuff within, within college, you know, I added a intercultural studies and biblical studies. I had an intercultural studies minor, but I added a biblical studies minor and was started taking more of the Bible classes and then um, continued with photography because I felt like God wasn't allowing me to, to get rid of that for some reason. Like it was supposed to still be an integral part of my life, which we see right now why it's very important. And what, why? Yeah. <laughs> you freaking <laughs> ball. ball. <laughs> but but so Y'all, if if you're listening to this right now trev's great he's got a lot of great filters oh god just kind of like stock images he's got a big old reservoir so just hit him up if you need like you know just just he's got some tips so if you need tips trev's your guy yeah give I, if you need a picture of a leaf i got you yeah 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 um but for me right i I didn't necessarily, like even in college, it, it was very goal oriented because I hadn't, like I performed super well in, in college in comparison to high school. I graduated with a 393. I did all this stuff in college. Like I had all these, I was like, I'm a win. Like, you know, I I, I really embodied my four with a, a three wing at that point. Like I was gonna do stuff different than everyone else, you know. Different and better. And better. That's what that four. That's what that four wing three means. It's not just different. It's different and better. Different and better than everyone. And so, and so, I was trying to like. I wanted to be like. I wanted to be like the the valedictorian of the the college or whatever. And then like I've got to be in a class or something. And then that went away and stuff changed. But, um, but, it like when I walked into seminary because there was a part of me where I was like I want to get good. But I, I wasn't as focused on just learning. I was I was focused on the goal. But for some reason, when it came to seminary, I knew off top, I'm not getting no dang PhD. I kind of feel like seminary is a, I, I had felt like seminary was like a necessary evil, which sounds terrible, but I felt like it was like this necessary step that I needed in order to become a pastor. And so then I found out it wasn't, and then I ended up. It turns studying. out it's not necessary or evil. Yeah, exactly. Not necessary nor yeah. evil. <laughs> but um, I I decided like, yo, okay, this is what I'm gonna do. I'm I'm gonna go in a seminary. And since I had this gap year, and then like when I came in for my visit to Emmanuel, I had a conversation with some of the staff there, and it was really like like Lauren Gullet, um, who's. I don't know Lauren's official title, but she does a ton of stuff with um, the admissions process of Emmanuel. And she said, you don't go to seminary for like a degree, you go for what you get from it. Um, and I remember coming in and I asked one of our professors, Dr. Bembry, um, if he could go back in seminary, like what would he tell himself? And he said, just learn everything that you can like learn as much as you can. And I was already in a mindset where I was like, I'm not trying to go to anything else beyond this. I, my grades don't matter. Like 
I still couldn't tell you what my seminary GPA is. I looked at it one time because um, a friend of mine in the beginning of my seminary journey was like, well, your grades came out. What'd you get? And I was like, I don't care. I like, I want to know if I learned the crap that Dr. Bembry taught in Old Testament or if I learned the stuff I was getting in Greek. Like, I want to know if I actually learned it. If I didn't retain it, who the heck cares about an A or a B? Um, and so I was very much so in that mindset and I didn't necessarily need to shift because I had already kind of walked into that space with that. And I feel like that was super beneficial for me. But I also feel like, so you had like a more kind of stable church upbringing than me. And so, you know, I, if, I think for you, it was like way more constant and steady, even though y'all jump from your dad pastoring Grandview, right? And then like going over to leading Mountain, right? Yeah, that was way back in the 20th century, though. I was, I was, <laughs> I was, I was, I was three. Uh, okay. That that didn't affect me a whole ton. I mean, it did, but also I was three, so. Yeah, so most of your life was just growing up in Mountain. Yeah. Okay, so like you had, you had like that long standing situation there. And for me, I felt like I had a lot of mixed situations because I do feel like prosperity gospel teachings, um, you know, which is this idea that like God wants you to be rich for those who don't know that. I felt like a lot of those were being like pimped to my family's kind of theological framework. And so I was hearing a lot of those messages and I had like a big kind of uh, unearthing of that in college. And like, I don't know, I, I don't know if like there was a deconstruction of that, a deconstructing of those ideas within college for me, but it wasn't like, I don't believe in God. It's like, I don't know what I think about this. And then no one had ever introduced me to reform theology. And so then people were talking about predestination and like God choosing a, a select few elect and and if you didn't get chosen, well, at least God just chose some people. And so God's gracious and you have to deal with it. And I'm like, what the heck does that mean? And so then it was a it was like a deconstruction for me or a pause, at least, because I was like, I don't know if I can share the gospel right now, because what you just told me just makes it seem like it's worthless to share the thing, because God's going to have the elect and that's what it's going to be. And that it is what it is you know, this, that, and the third. I'm like, I don't even know why y'all serve Jesus if you think Jesus is like that. And so there was like a shift for me because I it was something very new to me. But then King's philosophy and religion department was, although like King's a Presbyterian affiliated school and um, the, the head of philosophy and religion is Presbyterian and stuff, they also were throwing in harder questions and bringing in different, cultural narratives and stuff in history in some of my classes that made stuff like not be this like, whoo, this is completely wild to me when I walked into seminary. Like I knew about different creation narratives from from different cultures and, and the parallels to Genesis in some ways and, and other things that weren't like, you know, on par at the, on the same level. And so then I walked into seminary and I wasn't really shook, but I was like, this is interesting. Whoa, that's new information. And and as those processes were going, it, there was part of me that was like, frick, like there's certain people that had questions over my life that I could have just been like, this conversation is a little bit more like complicated than I'm making it out to be. Or it's like, um, it's okay that you feel like that, or you have these questions, you know, I remember in high school, there was this, this girl I was, I was hanging out with, um, was interested in at the time. And she had told me that she, she never heard God, no matter how much she prayed or cried. And I just responded to her and told her like, it's a still small voice, you know, you hear God in this still small voice. And I didn't know what the heck that meant. It was just something that I had heard in my life and I thought I was hearing from God. Um, 
and I, I wish I would have been able to say like, God can show up in your life in a whole lot of different ways. You know, God, I think the biggest way God shows up in our lives is people, you know, that God uses us as the hands and feet of Jesus, that we are the workers of, of Christ. And so we align ourselves with the principles of who God is. And sometimes God, you know, will have you come across some, some person who, who causes you to think something or tells you something and, and that that might change your, your outlook and, and stuff like that. So I don't know that, you know, that's, that's a really long answer, but I'm, I'm a man of very long answers. <laughs> you Trevor, what, you know, I know it's, it's, it's a shocking reality, but here we are. Crazy. But yeah, that's, that's, that's how I felt with, within that space and, and how, um, I don't know. Seminary wasn't, wasn't this like jolting moment like it is for, for some folks like you referenced to, but it definitely was a space for me where it was like, yo, it's okay that you ain't got all the answers and God is still God while you don't have all the answers. Um, but then it also goes to show like there is, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of worth in one, how you came up in terms of like having an upbringing that like people were like telling you it's okay to keep learning. And it's okay the way that I came up where I had, I was given like all these different theological pockets, um, but I did have like a root of this like teaching in class that was asking harder questions, even if they believed in a completely different theological slant than I was. Um, they were still throwing hard questions up in the air and were like, what do you do with that? You know, if like if faith is like a roller coaster and someone follows Jesus at this point and then like drops off the map for 20 years and then like reinvigorates their faith with faith was like that a process of sanctification. Were they a Christian in that 20 year gap or were they not? A, and like that were some those were some of the questions that were getting thrown out to us. And like, you know, introduction to, you know, theology, you know, part two or something like that. You know, those were some of the questions that. At King. At King, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, which was, was super helpful for me. Um, so, yeah, man. Hmm. Yeah, there, there's something to that about just the exercise of asking uh, courageous and creative questions, um, not just to raise hell, but but because I, I think that's that's a mode of faithfulness. Um, when, uh, when you've got the courage and the, the creativity and quite frankly, the honesty to kind of ask the questions that come, uh, I think, I think there's something pretty meaningful about that. Um, and that contrary to how some are raised or that, kind of asking questions is not a, um, is maybe actually a very important thing. Um, uh, but that, I mean, I think even that posture that you, you do a great job, Trevor, just of, of saying, I don't know about that. Or like, no, I don't understand. Like, like give, give me more information. You do a good job of that. And I can see how that um, is, is part of how you, engaged with your time in seminary um and how you um and it makes sense how you're kind of seeing some of that develop as you reflect on your time uh in college as well uh that makes sense that's something you do well which as a side note like that's a breath of fresh air because often folks it seems to me treat grad school like a time to kind of act like you know it all which is of course ironic to to try and do that at a school where the implication is that you're learning because you don't know it all um or, but or I, the implication of a school that is teaching you and preparing you for ministry which is to teach people who don't know in a way that they can take those things in 
at the simplest form or the more complex form at the same time. It's like the posture of humility is an integral part of what it means to minister. Yeah. yeah. And so it, it is very ironic. Yeah. But that's a, that's a gift that you brought to our classrooms and seminary where you'd you know, raise your hand and, you know, I'd like social norms in a, like a normal classroom would say like, you don't ask a question. Like when, when the prop says like, does anybody have questions? You're supposed to like keep your head down and just try to get class over with. But like you, are willing to have the honesty to say like, actually yeah like what in the world were you just talking about <laughs> uh and that but that's that when that happens when someone has the courage to do that there's never only one person who's a little confused there's never only one person who didn't get it um but often there's only one or often none that have the courage to say i, I i'm gonna be brave because i actually want to learn this not just look like i learned it or look like I already knew it. Um, and so I, and, and my kind of temptation and inclination is to try and like pass myself off as someone who like already knew that, or like, you know, remembered that first time or something. And I have a hard time admitting when I don't know something, but I'm, I'm helped and I am encouraged and made better by friendship with you specifically, but also, um, with other people who, around me who are willing to say, tell me more, or no, I didn't get that the first time, or you know, other things like that. Um, that's pretty important for me. And it, but there's, uh, you started that thought by thinking about how our stories are different, but legitimate and meaningful and generative sources for engaging something like seminary. And I think that maybe is a continuation of it that um, just the highlight for how our, how, how our respective experiences prepared us and how our kind of then experience in the classroom together was, I hope, mutually enriching, uh, because I felt, you know, enriched by your presence and your kind of the way that you contextualize and the way that you ask questions and that sort of thing, Re really meaningful and influential for me. Um, and that's precisely because we come from different places and have different stories yeah i appreciate you bro and that was absolutely it was absolutely an enriching experience for me like to have you in class as well um because one of the one of the things that you know i i remember really specifically like old testament um part one well yeah part one because i don't i wasn't there for part two most of the time <laughs> um but this but like old testament introduction i guess is the class because it's oti um but when you would speak, I've always found you to be a person who, at least in our conversations, is like a, a person who is quick to listen and slow to speak. And, and, and you're intentional about the way that you're thinking. And so like when you are chiming in, you're, you're adding in like actual like substantial value. Um, and, and I would, in, in times in class, especially because like OTI was a class that was really set up you know, within the lecture section of it where like, you know, whatever's going on the blackboard, you got to copy down and you're trying to figure out the formula to succeed or whatever. Well, it's going to be on the exam. Exactly. Exactly. And so it's like, what am I trying to do to succeed? What am I trying to do to, to execute? Um, but, you know, when you would bring in a thought from a reading or something that was enriching to you within that space, that was always like I love interaction. I like discussion, discussion based kind of classroom stuff way more because I feel like I'm actively engaging. I'm actively practicing out what I'm learning and it's going to stick with me better. And I always felt like you were adding in good stuff. But then even after, you know, we weren't having physical classes together and I was just staying in your house, um, whether it was your house with, you know, Henry, um, you know, roommate throughout much of your seminary journey and the person that people met on um, the return road Durag thoughts um, episode or with your wife abigail you know and and the the last you know year of seminary that you you all were rocking through living together um within that space and and i always felt like i could i would be coming out of class and i might have an idea or a thought or something and we would we would rock those things out. And there might be something that I wasn't as, as 
you know, I hadn't read enough on or I hadn't like persons who are reading enough and I might bring you a, a concept up and then you would check it or you would challenge it or you would say, well, it's it's not just this thing. It's it's this like I think about our conversation about speaking well of God, like how it's not you must refer to God as a woman or refer to God as a man or refer to God as um, gender neutral. But it's like, it's really the concept surrounding, are you speaking well of God? Because that's the intention to embody God wholly, um, both fully and set apart holiness, right? And yeah, to give to give a little a little credit there that that comes from Elizabeth Johnson, um, who's an exceptional theologian. She's got a beautiful book called She Who Is, um, where she helps to kind of uh, describe and present and unpack um, uh, feminine imagery for God. And, and I think there's a kind of a lot of the spaces where I am, there's a large effort to um, at least at reduce the kind of masculine pronouns and imagery around God um, and kind of introduce and increase um, our concepts for God that are maybe more naturally associated with um, feminine imagery and feminine pronouns and that sort of thing. And um, so for example, I don't, use masculine pronouns to refer to God. And that, that is, that has come out of this learning about how um, God has too often been cast in math and exclusively masculine imagery. Um, when in fact, in scripture, we're given a wealth of images of the way that God um, can, and in, indeed even should be kind of represented in feminine imagery. And, um, but Elizabeth Johnson's point in the midst of this book, uh, just beautiful, beautiful, just great, great book, uh, but where she's kind of arguing for the importance of understanding and um, having in our awareness the, the, the divine feminine, um, <laughs> she kind of makes this caveat that's really challenging of like, the point isn't to get all your, your pronouns right for how you call God, but, but the point in all of this is to speak well of God, um, is to speak truthfully and, and uh, accurately and um, in faith. Um, and yeah, and, and so that, that's, a, that's a challenge, I think, um, from her that I try and keep with me. But I, I just wanted to say, like, that's, that's where it comes from, and that's, uh, she's, she's a remarkable scholar and theologian. I'm really thankful for her kind of voice and influence in my own life. Yeah. And for those of you who don't know what a theologian is, it's just, yeah, yeah, yeah that's a good call. It's just the concept of thinking about God, like the study of who is God and like, what is God? Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's, that's basically what we're talking about when we're talking about theologians or theology the study of God. Um, and so, yeah, I remember talking about that and I was like, that's dope because also it's a little bit freeing to some of the masculine imagery um, and, and usages of stuff because I'm not saying that, I mean, I, I, I kind of limit my use of masculine pronouns in terms of God for a lot of the same reasons. I mean, there's a direct thoughts episode called God's not a dude for a reason. Um, but, I also think about within this space of life, um, the, the idea of, um, I think about the, the idea of, um, just within our friendship and, and how you've, you've enriched even conversations like that for me. Um, and, and I also think about the, the idea in the space of like, in seminary, which this is the challenge that I gave to seminary graduates in my, you know, to like our class in the, in the awards banquet, you know, situation, a virtual awards banquet or whatever, um, that I gave to the graduates was that basically your, your position as a, you know, master's degree holding seminary graduate, you know, is to is to not utilize your knowledge to flex on people and 
show them that you are more knowledgeable, more astute in the sense of what it means to study God. But your your mission is to lead people to Jesus, is to lead people closer to Jesus, utilize your knowledge to enrich people's understandings of God. Like you're not trying to use it to, like you were saying earlier, Nathan, like cause all hell to break loose, to just, to just cause a bunch of chaos and turmoil. But in the spaces that you are challenging new perspectives, new thoughts, new ways to view God, to enrich people's understanding, because it goes back to what you were talking about earlier with trying to, um, to, to try to like ask questions, right? To be, for it to be okay to ask questions. If no one ever allows you to ask questions about God and make that okay, and, and you don't have, you don't have like open dialogue, I would say that you're probably going to end up like either closed off and never thinking anything new about God. And it's just, this is how it is. And we don't ask questions um, because God is God and, and I'm not. And so I don't get to ask God anything. And that's what your theology becomes. Or you quit Christianity. Like you, you don't ever, you don't ever stay with it because you just feel like people's perspectives are, you know, they're not asking some of the, the questions of the, the culture. They're not asking, you know, some of, some of the things that, you know, people are, are wanting to, to really hold on to. So yeah, just, just in that space of like not utilizing, not utilizing theology, not utilizing your, your position as someone who is trained in these things to, to speak unwell of God, you know, to, to not ask questions and not, to give people a space to, to ask a lot of questions, which in a lot of ways is the heart of you know, a lot of what I talked about in this piece was like, you know, I learned it ain't about victory. Maybe we just need conversation, right? Like I've, it's not, it's not about me winning a debate about something that I learned and I'm smarter than you and I know God better than you, but it's like, maybe we just need to talk about some of these things and just be okay with saying, yeah, I don't know. Like let's journey through that together. Like, yeah, I don't know. I've never really thought about that in the space of my faith. Like, let me hold on to Jesus with this hand and then start searching through some of these conversations that you're you're kind of bringing into my mind now. Yeah, and I think that's one, that that's a really important posture to have. But alternatively, part of the reason that I think we would go to school is so that sometimes we can say kind of like internally, like, okay, I know, uh, I, I do know, but I also have thought about it and practiced it such that I can now make that meaningful. And I can make that like, I can make the connection that needs to be made in, in a, in a pastoral and a helpful and a contextualized way. You know, it's, the, it's not, it's, you're right. It's not about knowing a bunch of stuff, but also that's part of what happens. And and sometimes we can learn and we can know and we can prepare for a conversation or a, or a situation that arises. But even more important than like knowing the answer is having a sense of grace and humility about how to make that answer true, how, how to make that make sense. It makes me think uh, some of the advice that I give um, – it's actually funny. We're having this conversation today is the first day of school at Emmanuel. Um, my wife, Abigail's in class right now. And here I am not, um, uh, I'm, I'm outie. I'm, I'm done. Finished up my master's, uh, in May, which is crazy. Old man, mate. Um, old man. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's one of the pieces of advice that I, uh, that I kind of stumbled into that I now give, eagerly to people who are starting is to regularly spend time with people who do not care at all about seminary or a degree or perhaps even Christianity. Um, uh, because it, it will rob you of the illusion that what you're doing is automatically important to everyone else. Um, 
<laughs> because the like I said, like thinking about my life as gift, like the importance and the meaning and the value of my time here isn't just like I, I don't just like copy and paste, you know, from the classroom to uh, I play a lot of ultimate frisbee uh, to the to the to the ultimate frisbee field. Like that's not the point. Like if I go start reading lecture notes to a friend um, somewhere else. Uh, what are they going to care and why should they care about that? Um, but rather the, the model is, is, is can that come into my life in such a way that, I, that it helps me to bring and to be good news um, to, to these folks. It, and, but and I think that's helpful and important to have along the way um, uh, because the, the value of this time is it's, it's social. It's, it, it, it's, um, it does have to do with my increasing in my own love of God and my devotion to, uh, following Jesus. Uh, and that's, that's a non-negligible part of this time. Um, but I think, yeah, I, 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 there's like an, I'm trying to work up an analogy and I'm nervous it's going to fall flat, but I'm thinking about like some scientist or something. If they, uh, if they right now came and told me about how they were mixing, you know, this many milliliters of X chemical with, you know, this many other like grams of something else and this kind of a beaker and looking at D, I, I don't have access to that. But if they say, hey, I'm working on, um, I don't know, a coronavirus vaccine or something like that. And they, they find the way to bridge the gap from the nitty gritty kind of individual tasks that they're doing. And, and they, they, they would be able to find a way to kind of make that meaningful, to perceive what I need with respect to their discipline and to communicate that to me in a substantive way. And I think that's some of what, um, I, I think that's some of what you are talking about and that that's been a really important idea for me um that to just be able to recite the exercises or individual tasks that i did as part of my degree um that might be nice for shooting the breeze with another seminary student or someone who wanted to know those kinds of things but quite frankly most people don't care that much about <laughs> you know about uh and yet the reason that I did and stayed with my seminary degree is because I think it helps develop resources um, that can actually be beneficial and can actually bless and, and help and care for um, people who at this point wouldn't say they would care about anything that I had been learning in that kind of a classroom. Um, but I think that that puts the onus on me to do that work of translation, that work of incarnation, um, uh, to make it meaningful um, to the to the folks in the communities around me. Yeah, that's real because it is that work. I mean, even a prophet, right? You know, if you're looking at a biblical prophet, they're they're hearing from God now. They're speaking for God, kind of directly in certain stances. Um, you know, but there's also an, a sense of like interpretation, like you're you're funneling this in a way that it needs to be kind of given out. And you think about Jesus and his ministry, and you you see Christ as as this individual right who you know often spoke in parables and so jesus is interpreting these these uh kind of complex ideas into a way that can be understood both by children because it's as simple as a story that they could potentially hear but then like it's like a good album right me and my brother talked about this in the building a vision episode of direct thoughts like a good album that was made over five years is probably going to take you know, and this light goes, it might come back. It's done this before. And here we go. It's back. Woo! <laughs> we back. Um, and we back. Um, but yeah, so a good album that was made over five or 10 years, like a project that it took to create that it, you know, it likely might take another five to 10 years to, um, to reestablish it, like to, or to, to, to intake it, to, to break it down. Like, you know, you hear this song, you've heard the song for years and years and years and years, but then like you hear something new in it 
you after you listen to it or, or you notice something that you never noticed before. And so in the in the Bible and faith in a lot of ways is that lifelong kind of journey. But like, you know, so someone could hear this like simple parable from Jesus when they're five, but then they grow up and there's new life to the parable when when they really, you know, realize like what this thing is connecting to and what this metaphor was about and things like that. Um, and so, and then those who are like more astute at those times, you know, the, the Pharisees, the, the, the adults, like those who are, who are taking this in from a different perspective, they're all going to gain something different from it. But it's like translating this, this like universal truth into something that is, um, consumable, something that is, is able to be partaken by different individuals in different ways. And and I think that's so much of the work of what you're trying, you're aiming to do, because, you know, I think is why a lot of people say it's it's kind of foolish to go through seminary without like working in a church context or serving in a church context because you are forced to interact with people who, like you said, don't care about your lecture that week. They, you know, they're trying to like come to grips with, you know, the realities that they're dealing with, that they're they're car had a flat tire this week and they don't know how they're going to buy a new tire and so how can you embody this this complex you know theological concept into something that can help them in this moment you know and so i think sometimes people find seminary worthless because they can't um they can't do that work like they don't know how to uh they don't know how to interpret those things into life in certain ways um, or no one, no one else is necessarily doing that work for him. Cause I felt like a manual for me, um, you know, reflecting back after having graduated as well with, with Nathan, um, I felt like there wasn't a ton of classes that were really trying to do the interpretive work for you. It was like, you're an adult, you need to figure this out on your own kind of thing. And I, I do think that there should have been some more work that was done in some of those spaces because some people weren't coming from backgrounds like you or me, where they were um, had theological training in college coming into seminary. Some people were coming from engineering backgrounds or or certain certain people were like, like there was a cat in, in my program who was like a new Christian, like was an atheist and then like came to, to Christ in, in college and then like you know, I don't know if it was two years later or one year later or whatever, but started in the seminary journey. And I'm like, I don't know if that's good or bad. And he he probably has a, a perception of or, or, or I'm sure he has a perspective on what his journey was like and, and how that stuff affected him um, and for for better or for worse. But but I do definitely recognize that, like, um, different people have different experiences within that space and but there is definitely a need to to figure out and interpret what it is like the heady stuff the 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 really complex ideologies into things that are actually applicable to to real life applicable to you and your homies on that ultimate frisbee field you know applicable to me when i'm when i'm at some sort of like creative mornings or something you know applicable to me back when i was in college and was wrestling like i could learn all these these things in class about theology but i still have to go to my teammates and lead a bible study and um lead a prayer and 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 like you know my teammates are like do you really believe like all these miracles and stuff that like you see in the bible like do you really believe that all that stuff is actually real and, and they would often not ask it in convenient circumstances where we could have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. It would, they would ask it like in the locker room with like right. 20 other dudes there. And so then everybody clues in. It's like, what's Trevor saying? <laughs> it's like, ah, oh, frick. It's like, well, trying to get my sermon on or like have a conversation, um, which is funny. I'm gonna go off a quick story on something like that. So basically uh, on a Saturday morning, one time in college, there's a cat whose name was Jamie. He played basketball and he, he was from Australia and dude is an atheist, right? Uh, and there are a couple of my teammates who, Christian dudes, and they were at a party the night before and they, they like were getting asked a bunch of hard questions by Jamie about Christianity. And he was kind of like, 
debunking a bunch of different things, right? Or trying to. And uh, <laughs> they were like, yo, like I was getting my like breakfast and scooping out my eggs or whatever, just trying to have a nice little morning, sit down at the table, have a nice day. And then they're like, um, yo, Trevor, <laughs> yo, oh, we got Trevor. <laughs> like it's, it's on now. And I'm like, yo, what is happening? What is happening? <laughs> And put him, put me in, coach. <laughs> exactly, cut. And so I'm sitting there, like, yo, You're like some Pokemon. They're like, exactly, right? Like they pulled out the master ball. I was like, we got Trevor now. We good. And I was like, bro, what is happening? Yo, Jamie been saying this stuff. Blah blah blah. This, that, and the third. Woo, woo, woo. And so, yeah, you got, you got, tell him. And I'm like, oh God, what's up, Jamie? And so like we ended up at this table, right in the front of the dining hall, and we start having this conversation, but the table gets surrounded by students. There's like 20 people at this table right now. Like you have three, you have me and Jamie sitting down and my other like three teammates. And then this other guy uh, came in who was a Buddhist at the time and converted to Christianity probably a, a year or so later actually. Um, but all of a sudden, like Jamie would ask a question. They're like, no, that's why you stupid. And I'm like, shut up, Jamie, you're not stupid. <laughs> yeah. And so it was like that, it was like that over and over. And like this, this whole crowd is like throwing in all these questions about God and people are like viewing me as like this spiritual guru. And I'm like, oh, I don't even remember if I did a good job in that conversation aside from like telling them like, yo, like shut up. Yo, you're not stupid for asking that question. This is the way I understand that. This is what I think about that, you know? This is the stuff I don't have answers for. But it was like, yo, chill out, y'all. Like you have to, you have to like recognize that this person's coming from a completely different background than you, a completely different standpoint. And like you need to have conversations like this. This isn't a war. This isn't a battle. This isn't something that like you should be fighting these people over like who are different than you, who have different beliefs than you. You need to just sit down and have a conversation. Look at Jesus's life. But but it was just like, you questioned something that I have not had a question about and that made me feel uncomfortable and I'm coming at you. And I was like, everybody calm down. Um, yeah. But it was, I mean, that's, that's the sort of work that I think that we need. We need those relationships in our lives. We need those friendships. We need those, those people around us to ground us. Um, yeah. especially so, as so people, many, well, especially as people who are trained in this stuff. Sure. Yeah. I was just going to say, there, there's so many things that are on display kind of in that moment. Um, you know, ranging from just in general, when we feel that something's important, it, it grips us as humans. I think that's part of what it means to be human is we gravitate toward what we believe is important you know so so you just feel everyone kind of crowding around regardless of the different individual levels of conviction or commitment there's something about humans that we want to like gravitate toward what's important but also on display is we often just we can all so often we get just mired in thinking about conflict and um like debate and like a winner and a loser or, or a competition, you know, our, from the way that we have chosen to set up our economy to reward those who win, um, you know, that, that is reflected all over. And one of the places is, is in our conversations, but, um, but also I see reflected in that moment, not only the kind of yearning to just learn about things that are important um, and the kind of often the inclination to just make things a competition that don't have to be and indeed shouldn't be, um, there's also the importance of like doing that together and how much of like no, no one or even two of you could have had that conversation alone. Um, that to have that time be meaningful, it required the input and the support and the attention of others. And, um, then there's probably more we could reflect on if we really tried, but I just, that it strikes me that so many just kind of common, like more general and common tendencies are present in that, in that story. And I think it's actually in some ways fitting that you don't have a clear memory of 
someone getting like getting the belt, you know, for for winning the round, you know, winning the match or something like that. Um, uh, because that's just, that's that ain't it, you know. That's uh, I, I don't know. I, I thought that was just maybe, maybe interesting as as reflective of um, what's going on and in our role that you know to that seems like you were trying to kind of decenter your own the the propensity of the people around you to maybe like expect you to be more than you should be because you're not going to sit there and just give teachings you know part of what you want to do is facilitate good questions and help find like meaningful journeys and and more so than just kind of ripping off quips that answer questions um uh yeah, so I, I don't know. There just seems like there's a lot that's represented even in that story of, of kind of what we're talking about, what we're trying to make possible. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. It was, I mean, it was, it was quite, it was quite the conversation. I feel like a lot of my college experience had a lot of moments like that because um, I got kind of viewed as like the, the student Christian leader on campus, like, because people kind of saw that I practiced what I preached. Um, and and sometimes that was annoying to some folks, I imagine. And then sometimes it was like encouraging because at least they knew somebody who was like, like real, um, was a hundred with their stuff. I was like, Nathan is frozen. Yeah, I imagine so. I mean, it just popped up that my internet connection is unstable. There's there's sometimes spikes or something where it's or it's weird. But anyways. We're back, so that's good. And it was a it was a pretty quick little flake in the internet. But we back. We back. Um and so but but this I think this kind of is a good caveat to um probably the most controversial um line of this this record, which I think is is worth kind of having a conversation surrounding. It's like um, you know, I learned it ain't about victory. Maybe we just need conversation because for real, who killed Goliath, Elhanan or David? And maybe it ain't. Yeah, so Trevor, could you just walk us through some of first Samuel 17 and kind of what, what we're, uh, what we mean by that? Yeah. So, you know, and, and before I, I say anything that I'm, I'm thinking about here. So like, basically it's like, and the end of it goes, maybe is maybe it really ain't as plain as we make it out to be, but ask yourself is your savior pages or the one hanged on a tree. Um, and so I want y'all to hear me first off to know, like, I'm not, I'm not trying to insinuate anything to make you just say like the Bible's trash and it's, 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 uh, it's unreliable and there's, there's no, nothing good within it. But what I am getting at is the story of David and Goliath and the, um, the individual who slayed Goliath, there are two different individuals at least from my understanding and nate might have a different viewpoint on this which is healthy in these conversations right but in you know in the bible there are there is there are two different individuals who it says kill goliath one is elanon one is david and there are different theological interpretations upon who actually did that um and and why people lean certain ways some People, you know, some theologians think that it was Elhanan, but David got credit because of, you know, just the way the kind of like power dynamics or, or whatever worked within that time and space. And some people, you know, have a viewpoint that it was actually David. Um, and and for me, it doesn't really matter. Like, I'd probably just hold to David, kill Goliath. But I I... I think what it does bring into question is like, um, you know, maybe the way that I have been viewing scripture is different than what scripture is trying to claim scripture as like, and I never asked that question because someone like when I was young, because it was told to me how I was supposed to view scripture. It was almost till college before I figured out that like scripture was like a bunch of collections of different people writing about God. Like there was a time where I thought every word in the Bible was God speaking 
because that's just how it was communicated to me. So it would just be like, open up a part, God's talking, um, when which is not accurate at all because there are, you know, a letter from Paul to the Ephesians, like a letter from Paul to the Ro ch Roman church. Like there, there's like clear indications that there are people writing these things for sp specific purposes. Um, and, you know, many of them with full knowledge that they, they're probably writing scripture, but like the, there, there was just that the way the culture was surrounding me when I was really young was very much so like, this is God talking. And so I didn't, I like, I had to, I got greater knowledge about that as time kind of pressed on. And so it doesn't, it doesn't really bother me that there is that like there are parts in the Bible that are that might be saying certain things differently, but like it's it's back to what I was saying of um, what is the Bible trying to claim itself as? What is this book trying to claim itself as? What is Deuteronomy trying to be? What is Romans trying to be? What is you know Daniel or Hosea like? What does this book claim of itself rather than what am I? reading into it you know because so much of what our work is when we're trying to like peer into the bible or really anything in life um any text or whatever is to first kind of take off our glasses stop reading into it with our lens and to like try to understand the root of what the thing is because like when you change like when you just interpret off top which it's kind of impossible just to purely interpret because we're humans and we have tendencies and upbringings and stuff like all these things coat our understanding. But there is a lot of an effort to try to get to the heart of or the root of something and then kind of do the work of um, exegesis as we talk about in kind of theological terminology or like drawing out from the text like um, you know, we, we're trying to refrain from like reading into the Bible or reading into the text, which is like that concept of eisegesis, I believe. I think I'm right on that. Um, and so, yeah, within that space, it's like, okay, so what are these books claiming of themselves and what are they trying to be and, and what are they trying to communicate to people? And I use that as a, I use that, that phrase specifically as as something that's like hey this might be different from the way that you were raised this might be different from the way that you've peered at this and and that's and that that's why like in moments like the jamie moment you know in moments where you know people are coming in with different perspectives instead of jumping down their throats and becoming very confrontational, maybe it really ain't as plain as we make it out to be. Maybe it's a little bit more complicated and we can show each other a little bit of grace and have some conversations about, okay, so what do you think? And why do you think that? And where, where'd you grow up? And what's your background like? And let me, like, let's talk about this and, and kind of dive in this together. Let's, let's, let's maybe, you know, have some fuller conversations and what, what is kind of affecting your viewpoint on some of these things and what's affecting my viewpoint and why do I view this this way and really just have some like authentic conversations because if I one of the things that I believe about our generation is that we care about authenticity right like we care about what is real and and so to put up a front or to 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 act like okay I just know everything I think a lot of this generation and the generation behind us, Gen Z, you know, is not really cool with that. You know, it like wants to see people being more authentic and people being more real and people being more honest to what stuff actually looks like. Yeah, I, I think you're spot on. And I, yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah, I. And so again, kind of, kind of stepping into that space, you know, 
just be willing, be willing to like enlarge your perspective. Um, you know, one of the things I think was so helpful for, for me in seminary, um, because I don't, I don't think I, I explained this to people, but I started out my seminary journey as an on-campus student in the Masters of Divinity program, which is kind of like the, the, the standard, like hallmark kind of seminary degree. And that's what Nathan has a master's degree in. Um, and I switched to the Masters of Art and Christian Ministries program because I got a job offer in Raleigh, North Carolina at a church. And which was was a really great move for me. I, I think it was the best move for me because I feel like I would have been dying without have, being able to do the art that I needed to do in some capacity, like still having art com completely and wholly a part of my life with seminary, you know, the readings, the reading level of what you needed to do in an MDiv um, and, and some of the time commitments that you had to put together for it was a lot less manageable if I was going to try to keep art as such a massive part of my life. And I was feeling some of those tensions um, really strongly when I was just in that first semester on campus with Nate when I met him. Um, and so, you know, with, within, within that space of time, um, I'm trying to think where, where was my thought going with that within that space of time, um, and like just, just gaining some understanding in some of those classes or getting new knowledge about certain things. Um, it just really made me think about some of those conversations growing up. And, and for those of you who are Christians, you probably have some moments that you can think back to, to some friend asking some hard question and, you know, or someone like bringing up some concept that was really different than what you had known. And maybe think back to like how you responded in those spaces of, of life. And then, you know, just really kind of considering like how to interpret, but then also like, oh, that's what I wanted to get back to. So um, one of the most helpful things for me in that seminary journey off top was spiritual formation, which were you in my spiritual formation class? I don't think so. Did you, when did you take it? Uh, first semester, I think with Tim Ross. Yeah, I was there. Okay, bet. So we were in the same class. I, I just had a different group than you. I had a different formation group. Um, so that class was really helpful because I think Tim Ross was really trying to ground us in you're going to hear some things that are going to ch like challenge your perspectives of the world. But what you need to do in this, he like urged us to like hold on to Jesus with one hand and then with the other hand, look into this other stuff and keep holding tight to Jesus, but like explore some of these different regions, these different new things. And I felt like those of us who really internalized that it was very helpful to the rest of the seminary journey. Um, yeah. And it was very helpful to me uh, because we were just, we, we were learning so many different things and gaining new perspectives of the world and, or, or even just like expanding ideas that, you know, we might've had questions about or learning new things about. Um, and now, yeah, it's just, it's, it's a little bit different. Um, then, then at least for me of like my understanding at that time. And, and I, cause I don't, I don't think I had like a massive shift in my theology or anything like that. I just learned a whole bunch of new things that kind of helped, you know, push some conversations forward. So sure. yeah, just be open to growth. Um, yeah. your doubts, your questions, like those things aren't evil, yeah. but they can that's actually be things. enriching. Yeah, I was gonna say that's one of the things I appreciate in in that in that lyric that you talk about like analytical mindsets, um, that those aren't, that, that you say those are actually God-given skill sets and tendencies and attributes. Um, 
And I think for a lot of folks who are trained to kind of be wary of or, or to kind of circle the wagons against uh, someone who might ask hard questions or who might be have a, have a proclivity for skepticism or criticism. Um, but there's a place for that and, and we need that. And, and the church very often has not done a good job of making space um, to harbor people's hard questions and to respond to them meaningfully. And I, but I appreciate that you're, that just in this piece, you're not, it's, it's not a matter of just getting rid of an analytical mindset, or it's not a matter of getting everyone to have the same analytical mindset, but, r- but rather recognizing that um, that's one of the many kind of tendencies that, that we need um, with us. You talk about complementary experiences and the way that um, different people's past experiences and present tendencies kind of work together to be mutually enriching. Um, I, I think that uh, I, I think that this piece in this piece, you do a good job of kind of pointing pointing that way to say, yes, th- this is part of what we what we need. Yeah, I appreciate that, dog. And because and 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 you just saying that right now just kind of made a different connection for me because like I, I'm trying to remember who it was. I think it, I, I've I've quoted like propaganda, the spoken word poet slash rapper, um, a a couple of different times throughout this series because props a really big influence for me. Uh, but yeah, I like prop a lot and. But one of the things I remember Prop saying, I think it was in a piece where he was talking about like, um, it was a, it was a, it was actually a rap song, and it was on his, his album Crooked, and he was like, um, and if they can't touch it, then they can't trust it. That's why they can't explain the love in my daughter's eyes, like. And he was talking about, um, I think like he was, I think he was talking about like white European culture. I'm trying to remember the lyric before it, um, but was really kind of talking about like there there was there was a, a bit of a more kind of, maybe it was like more Protestant Reformation kind of ideologies that kind of sat within the more kind of analytical space. Um, but when I think about that, it's like, but that doesn't make it not God given, right? Like, yeah. like the, the experience of white Christians, like, and the, the gifts and stuff of white Christians are still God given gifts. Um, you know those and so if my heart be as a black christian you know who's had a lot of experiences in black churches um you know when i was young and some of the stuff that was instilled in me by my mom and stuff like that is one way but then like you know my homies who are like way more minded in an analytical space or i've got black homies who are scientists or something and like they are analyzing fully and they're not compartmentalizing analytical versus spiritual. And and so they they are like asking questions that are like, I need to see some cause and effect, some synopses, some proof, some some uh, hypotheses that are, are kind of built out. And there is an element of faith always that like there's some sense that like you you won't always be able to touch the thing. Like you have to believe that the wind exists based upon feeling it, right? Um, but at the same time, it's like, yeah, these are God given spaces and I can't, I can't, I can't tell people that like, this doesn't matter. Like what God gave you and the way that your mind is thinking, like it, you're broken, right? Like you asking that question and you having that doubt and you trying to get some proof of this and you questioning the history of this event or this event or or this narrative is wrong. Like because your mind thinks that way and you should be more faithful. Like that's a completely wrong approach. You know, it's it's to press into those spaces and just be like, maybe we maybe we just need to start with a conversation. Grab a cup of coffee with somebody. Like invite somebody over for dinner like post up and have some convos and and then rock from there and allow yourself to be enriched and stuff because like here we go with this light again but like as 
as we try to like grow and have conversations with people and and develop you know who we are you know in this process of you know sanctification as it's kind of called in big theology words but the idea is just being made more like jesus by the time that we're dead and like into eternity and so like if we're in this process of like being made more like jesus we're gonna have to ask some questions and go to some spaces that we've never been before you know i've got this quote that's like um that or this this i wrote this thing out that's pinned or uh sticky noted to the bottom of my my imac screen that's like to go where you've never gone before you're gonna have to do some things that you've never done before and and i think that faith is a journey you know it's a journey with god it's a walk with god it's a it's it's you know navigating through these different spaces and and seeing new things and exploring new things you know and and seeing with new eyes and seeing old things with new eyes and in all these different things. And so in order to do that, you're gonna have to take some steps into some new places, or you're gonna have to get some new perspectives to look at the same things in different ways. Um, you know, me and Henry had talked about on the Return Road episode, just about like, you know, maybe there's times where like, now you're you're coming through this valley in this area, and now like you're realizing like, oh, these mountains are really pretty. I've never really looked up at them, but I've driven this road for years and years and years. and. And so I think it's it's some of those things, just like allowing yourself to see with new eyes and and you know question, but allow those things to enrich and grow and and shape you in new ways. Yeah. Any closing thoughts from you, Nate? Well, I I, I don't don't have much to add except to say thank you. Um, just uh i've mentioned to some how important kind of your life and your questions and your reflections have been through my own time of growth and learning and questioning um that i've i've been just personally enriched um and i'm thankful for kind of that aspect of what's going on right now just a chance to remember together um journeys that we've made um and journeys that we uh, are still engaging um, journeys. We still find ourselves because I hope that something that comes through for folks listening is that um, seminary seen in this way is is just one of the ways to engage a lifelong um, desire to grow and to learn and to um, live more like Jesus and to honor God with our minds and learn to love our neighbors and learn to integrate um, those things together such that our worship and our life and our friendships are, they're, they're bound up together and they're, they're, it's not easy to draw lines between those different ways of living um, or kind of modes of existing i guess um and i and i appreciate and, and i'm so thankful to get to share that ongoing part of my story and journey with you with you and and the way that uh you're also committed to that um uh, uh process of becoming you know as as it as is a word that you use a lot um and uh so um, we also on one level, I just thank you and appreciate the kind of individual level here, but what this represents is also kind of a larger way that you are trying to encourage and to exhort and to um, challenge uh, perspectives and uh, to, um, to bring um, hope uh, to the marginalized and oppressed. You say that, rather regularly, but I'm thankful that this is something that's happening, not just between us, but that I get to be a part of what you are doing on a larger scale for people that you both know personally in your life, as well as uh, people that you don't know and you won't ever meet. Um, uh, but I appreciate it. And I'm thankful for the way that you are living out what you are uh, talking about uh, folks listening. If you haven't gotten a chance to meet Trevor. Um, he's, he's the real deal. He's, he's working on living out, um, 
what you see, whether it's in front of the camera or behind the camera or um, in, in these words, um, he's, he's living it and he's, he's doing it. And um, I'm thankful that you've found his stuff. Um, uh, cause he, he's a good one. Um, so, and I, and I think that's been on display, Trev, and I, I'm glad that, that you are doing the work of sharing, um, the gifts and the resources and the talents and the insights that you have, um, with the kind of clarion focus, um, toward, uh, liberation and toward, um, toward justice, uh, and toward, um, uh, a more beautiful, community a more uh you know we, we dr king talks about the beloved community and, and our work to realize that among us now um and i'm thankful to be kind of engaged in that work with you and to be learning from you in that work um and to be a small part of this podcast series um in advance of this record which uh i've gotten to see firsthand uh how much it means and how much work you put into it. Um, uh, cause it really is, it matters that much and it's that important and it's that good. And so I'm thankful that you're working so hard to share your really substantive and meaningful story. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I'm super thankful to have gotten to share the time with you today. Yeah. I appreciate you, dog. Um, one of the things I want to say about Nate is, uh, which, which shows in the ways that he talked today, is that um, one of the things that, that has stuck out to me from seminary into now is that, which is a really great display of what it means to be a minister, is that I've never seen any job be too low for Nathan and any job be too high. Like Nathan, as a seminary student, wasn't too low to mow yards for money. But Nadi, that's where the money is. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for for real though, I've got a homie who like a, a kid I grew up with that like has a has a lawn care business and uh landscaping business and stuff now that started because he was a kid doing it. Um but you know, mowing lawns for money, you know, in comparison to like I was working in a church and and so it's like some folks might be like, "No, I'm in seminary. I need to be doing the work of Jesus. Y'all aren't seeing my gifts." And Nathan's like nah, I'm cool. Like <laughs> I'm gonna, like me and Henry about to go mow a couple yards a day. We're going to come back and read and like things like that. And like serving in, in his church for the years that he has throughout his entire experience at Milligan and then through Emmanuel. And then even now after, um, as, as him and Abigail are, are like rocking through this final year of her seminary journey as well. And, and just seeing that at work, that at, at, play uh has always been an important and inspiring thing for me and and i and i think it really plays out in his life in the ways that um a leader is always a servant leader you know a good leader is a servant leader a, a good leader should be with the people in all realms of what that looks like and so you're never too high for the conversation with the lowest, and I mean like the lowest is in the least of these, like the people who society views low, not in the sense of value of a person's worth, because God views all people as, you know, image bearers of who God is, um, and or conversations with the way that people view the highest people. Like there's a range that sits within all that. And I think that's really displayed well through Nate's life. I also think that this, uh, rug situation or tapestry or whatever it is that's right behind your head keeps making you look like you're in a painting and i wish i could paint because i'd make some like really dope like regal painting <laughs> like every time you move forward i like see the background kind of blur and you sit like perfectly in the middle of it y'all who aren't watching this and are just listening to this are are not really able to experience this but you should go on youtube and and, and peep that too but it's just like it's 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 really it's really uh, a sight to behold very perfect and shout out to abigail for always bringing the vibes um, um in the household and the hook kachera's household and um how it's worked out so well with what we're doing today so yeah appreciate you nate thanks for taking the time y'all yeah. tune in uh for monday when we will be dropping the final track 
in the series, the final episode in the series of City of God, um, where you get to see some some of the, the visuals that I'm most proud of, some of the stories that I'm most proud of. And then tune in for next Friday, which will be coming at the new year. Um, and that Friday, we're going to be dropping the final episode of, I guess, the evaluative part of the Durag Thoughts season for City of God. So should be a treat. Thanks, y'all for tuning in. If you haven't seen any of what has come before this, go back, start at the beginning of the series, work towards the end, really press into this because um, it, I think it's the best work I've ever made. And I think it's a really important work. And I've, I've been grateful to include a lot of my friends and and their stories and their journeys and my my journeys together as uh, we we aim to to continue to rock towards what is, is good and um, part of God's will and build something worth becoming. Appreciate y'all. Catch you on the flip. Be easy, be safe. Peace. Make, make, make sure and like, comment, subscribe. Is that what you say at the end of one of these? I mean, I will absolutely. I, I have to do it different for the podcast because you can't- I, I, just, always, I just always wanted to say that. <laughs> <All right. Hey. laughs>